Hey everybody, welcome to quarantine lesson number three, symbiotic relationships. So we're finally getting into something that's new and it's not a repeat of seventh grade. There's only three types of relationships, so it shouldn't be that hard. And one of them you've already heard of before. If you're following along in your notebook, we're on page 66. The title is symbiosis. And your essential question is, what are the three major types of symbiotic relationships? So let's just dive right on in. Your first vocabulary word is symbiosis. And I have broken it down into three different parts. We have the prefix, we have the root word, and we have the suffix. So our prefix is sim, which if you look it up, means with, together with, or in company with. Your root word is bio, which means life. And your end, your suffix, is cis, which is a state or condition. So if we put all three of those together, it's basically a state or condition of life together with other life. Our official definition is different species that are interdependent. That means they depend upon each other, unlike organisms living together in a close, long-lasting association. It is not a herd of wildebeest all working together so that the lions don't eat them. We need different species working together. And we're not just talking about like, oh look, this one little bird is a friend with this one little dog. Isn't that cute? Because you see those all over the internet. No, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about whole species. So this is one of those evolutionary things where this species has developed so that it works together with this other species. I'm going to give you some examples. And then after I give you three examples of it, I am going to give you what the definition is. So we're gonna start with mutualism. If you take a minute, check out your picture, you notice the bumblebee and the flower, right? The bumblebee goes to the flower to get energy from the nectar. As the bumblebee is on the flower, pollen from the flower gets onto the bumblebee's body, and when it lands in a different flower, some of that pollen shakes off, and that helps the flowers get pollinated, and it helps the bee get food. Another example is an antelope and a tick bird. I bet you can figure out what a tick bird eats. So the tick bird eats pests like ticks, fleas, and other creatures that would live on the antelope. It helps keep the antelope healthy, and that helps the tick bird get something to eat. So the antelope gets health, the tick bird gets food. You will also see these, by the way, you see a whole bunch of these, like when you see African savannas, and you see like the little white birds that are on the back of the rhinos and stuff. Same kind of situation there. And here's one of my favorites. Each one of those little lime green blobs on there is an aphid. Aphids are tiny little defenseless creatures. There you are, you see them. Uh, and here are some ants tending to the aphids. Aphids get food from the plant. And what aphids do is they take some of that food which would be the sugary plant liquid, the glucose, right? Put some of it on their back. Now ants, as every, I mean, hopefully everybody knows, as everybody knows, if not, you know now, ants are really attracted to sugar. So ants will actually crawl along the aphids and lick their backs to get some of that sugary liquid. So the ants are using the aphids as a food source without hurting the aphids. And because the aphids are fairly small and helpless, the ants protect them. I'm about to like rock your world here. Ladybugs are predators. And ladybugs most common prey is aphids. So ladybugs will actually prey upon aphids and the ants will protect the aphids from the ladybugs. So that's our definition of mutualism there. We have two different species, they're working together, and the key word of that is both species benefit in some way. In all of our examples, nobody was hurt, no harm happened, everybody was happy. Aphids get protection, ants get food. Tick bird gets food, antelope gets protected from disease. Bumblebee gets food, the flower gets pollinated. So both species get a benefit out of their working relationship. So here's an example of commensalism, a hermit crab. A hermit crab is a soft shelled crab, which means it doesn't have a hard back. So it needs a shell. 
What it does is it'll go around and it actually backs itself up into like empty shells and it'll carry those shells around with them. If you ever get a hermit crab as a pet, you have to provide like a whole bunch of different size shell for your hermit crab or it's going to die when it grows too big for the shell it's in and you just killed your pet. Now nothing is in those shells. They are old shells. The snails or whatever that were in them are long gone. They are dead. The hermit crab did not kill that thing. It is just using the empty discarded shells that other organisms used to have. Another example, you can see it way back in the back there, um, right at the edge of the trees in the dirt, we have some vultures and then we have lions. Now these things don't bother the lions, the lions don't care, but the vultures will follow the lions around for obvious reasons because once the lions are done eating, and you can kind of see the chest cavity of whatever it is that they, uh, they killed there. You can see the big black spot in the ribs there. But once the lions are done eating, they'll leave. And of course, the vultures are right there, ready to go to pick off whatever leftover meat they can from what the lions killed. Our last example are clownfish and anemones. Uh, the anemone is poisonous. And in fact, the anemone is hunts, I guess you could call it hunts, uh, by stinging other creatures that swim through it, other fish, and bringing it in, right? The clownfish does not react to the poison. As far as I've last researched, they haven't figured out why. They don't know if a clownfish just doesn't respond to the poison. They don't know if it doesn't, like, if it's immune to the poison. They don't know why, but the clownfish does not react to the poison. So therefore, a clownfish will make its home in an anemone. So that gives the clownfish protection from predators. All right, so let's check out our definition of commensalism. Commensalism is two different species interacting so that one of them gets a major benefit and the other one basically doesn't care. It doesn't get a benefit, but it isn't harmed either. So like the lions and the vultures, do the lions care that the vultures there? Nope. It's going to still hunt whatever it wants to hunt and eat whatever it wants to eat. But the vultures get a major benefit because they get to pick off whatever's left. The clownfish gets a major benefit of protection, but the anemone still does its job without the clownfish there or with the clownfish there. So it doesn't make a difference to the anemone. They used to, and sometimes you will still find anemones and clownfish as a mutualism but that's kind of been discredited because they can't see any way that the clownfish living in the anemone is an advantage for the anemone. So they've been moved to a commensalism relationship status. All right, our last one is everybody's favorite, parasitism. So this is a picture of mistletoe. Yeah, right, the same mistletoe that around Christmas time, people like hang it up so that you kiss under it. It's a poisonous plant. Anyway, mistletoe is a parasite. It grows up in trees. It does not have its own stems that will hold it up the way that a tree trunk will. And so what it will do is it'll dig into a tree so that it can get a higher place up. And if it's higher up, it can get more sunlight. So mistletoe is a parasite of a tree and that it is taking the water and food from the tree and using it for a better position of sunlight for photosynthesis. There is the possibility of there being so much mistletoe in a tree. It's basically, you kind of, you say it chokes the tree, even though it's not like really choking it, but there's just so much mistletoe, it'll end up killing the tree. You will especially see mistletoe in winter time because there's no leaves in the trees. And so the big green clump in a otherwise bare tree is going to be mistletoe. This is called ringworm. It is actually a fungus, not a worm. Uh, this guy obviously has it on his face. And think about a fungus, what a fungus does is it breaks down dead things. So if it's in your skin, what is it breaking down? Oh, it's eating your skin, okay? So it's breaking down organic material, your skin, breaking down your body tissue. 
By the way, if you ever happen to get ringworm, you need to get an antifungal cream. Not, you know, it's not a real worm. They call it ringworm because it goes in circles, but it's an actual fungus. And then everybody's favorite parasite, a mosquito. We can actually put mosquitoes, ticks, and fleas all together because they do basically the same thing. They will land on your skin, pierce your skin, and then feed off your blood. Because they are feeding off your blood, it's very easy for them to transfer diseases from one organism to another. Mosquitoes will carry, what, West Nile virus? Um, ticks will carry Lyme disease, and then fleas, don't usually affect people as much as they do dogs, but fleas can transfer heartworm. So, our definition of parasitism is we have two different species interacting, but now one of them benefits and the other one is harmed. This is different than predation. They are not predator and prey relationship here. A mosquito is not going to hunt and kill a human being. So it doesn't count as a predator. It would count as a parasite because it will live off of the human being or whatever animal it's biting, but it's not hunting, killing, and consuming for food. So that's the difference between parasites and predator prey is your parasite usually doesn't kill their prey. Um, now they may transfer a disease that will kill them. It may be like the mistletoe and so much will grow that the tree can't even like do its own photosynthesis because there's so much mistletoe in it. So parasites usually will not kill their own hosts, but they will cause harm to their host. And that's it for today. If you go to Google Classroom, there's only one quiz this time. It's called Symbiosis Quiz. And I think there's only three questions on it. And that finishes up lesson three about symbiotic relationships. I hope you're all doing well and staying safe. Make sure you go to Google Classroom and you finish the one little quiz. Hopefully Google Classroom is working better. If it's not, please send me a message and let me know. And Ms. Troxel's cat approves this message. <laughs>